Good evening, everyone. Let me make sure I'm set up here. So, turn with me to Job. That is what we are going to be focusing on tonight. I, uh, I told Preston to um, try to have a fairly quick song service because <laughs> I am working a little in uncharted territory here. Uh, it, it's just a monster of a subject, uh, the book of Job, and especially to cover in, in the allotted time. Uh, I taught a class on Job a few years ago, and this is an extremely condensed version <laughs> Of, uh, of just a section of that, of that class. Um, I think normally this would be about a three-hour monologue, and so, yeah, yikes, I know, I know. Uh, so please don't think this is a proper full study of, uh, of Job. Um, the purpose of this lesson is really just to give a general framework uh, that will help, hopefully, help us understand the, the content and the purpose. The way this is going to work, ideally, uh, is I'm going to give you a painfully long introduction <laughs> in which all of you will be very nervous, very nervous, uh, because, you know, it's like, hey, we haven't even started on the book yet. This is starting to get awkward. But I'm going to do a lightning quick run through of the book itself, at which point you will be relieved and, uh, uh, because it will actually go pretty, pretty quick. I think I've cut this down to a manageable size, uh, but just realize that Jones Road is currently a test bed, uh, so we're all doing something new here, um, and especially since I like my lessons to be around 20 minutes, if I can help it. So, uh, so yeah, to start, does anyone know what the GAO is? I know we got some accountants in here, so they might know. Uh, if, if they don't know, I highly doubt any of you know. The GAO is um, the Government Accountability Office. The Government Accountability Office. Can you guess what they do for a living? They audit the IRS. <laughs> what a job, right? That's some payback, I would say. Uh, or at least, you know, you would hope. Sometimes, I think, at least speaking for myself, Sometimes we can find ourselves in situations throughout life that we just we don't understand. And we can be tempted to wish that someone might audit God, that someone might call God to account. The typical questions that, you know, that they're age old and it's been throughout every culture is, you know, you know why, why am I having to go through this? Why me? Why now? Why am I suffering? Or even if it's really, I've met people who are just as depressed as, as you can imagine. They're suicidal. They have all kinds of, of mental issues. It can, it can devolve into even questions of, you know, what kind of world have you created, God? It seems like, you know, if he just made it this way or did it this way, it would be a lot better. There's, a, uh, there's an older movie that um, uh, I think it's Robin Williams. Yeah, it's Robin Williams. It wouldn't necessarily recommend. It's just a good example. Uh, he plays a guy with a lot of difficulties. Uh, eventually, his fiance is killed. He's just in a miserable place in his life. And, and he ends up having kind of this, it's one way, of course, conversation with God. And as he's doing that, he's standing on the edge of a cliff, and he's trying to figure out if he's going to commit suicide. And he says, please tell me what you're doing here, God. I don't understand. You know, you, you make people, they suffer, and sometimes they suffer to an incredible degree throughout life, and then they die. You know, no explanation given. Have we ever felt like that? Have we ever witnessed the, the horrors of life and, and faltered, questioned maybe, what is God doing? 
Well, the book of Job is going to give us a little help here. But it might not be the kind of help uh, people necessarily think it is giving them. Uh, we tend to think in the, mi- in the middle of, of going through a hard time or suffering that, hey, you know, Job suffered. Um, I should just, you know, I should go to that book. Maybe I'll, find, uh, maybe I'll find some answers as to why I'm suffering. And what happens is, is we read the book, we get to the end of it, and uh, <laughs> we, I, like for me anyway, when I was first reading Job, you know, I back up a little bit and it's like, did I miss something? I don't, under- I don't understand. There's got to be more to it than that. It didn't tell me anything. And the problem, of course, is we're reading the book of Job with certain expectations. And they originate from our own line of thinking, our circumstances, our questions that are specific to us. And, of course, we don't find the answers to our questions in Job. And we we come away thinking that it's the Bible's fault, that God has just somehow let us down. But if we're studying Job in good faith, we're forced to take a look at the book and ask some serious questions on how, how are we supposed to interpret this book. And to start, I want to present a set of keys here in just a second uh, to focus on that will help us understand the, the book of Job. Um, and this is going to help us understand not only what the book is doing, but also what it's not doing. And as we go through, notice that, that the answers, they don't really come from Job himself. And certainly not, certainly not his friends. Uh, his friends are wrong, and Job, although he gets a lot of things right, he's also wrong in terms of his mentality. So we, we don't need to be trying necessarily to take our pointers uh, from them. So, key points. Point number one. Job has trials. This is an important distinction. He has trials, but he is not on trial. Go ahead and turn, uh, I just told you to turn with me to Job chapter 1. So if you're already in Job, Job chapter 1, I'm not going to read much tonight because I actually don't have time. (laughs) But I do want to read the first eight verses because there's so much that it tells us just at the beginning of the book that gives us an idea of what, how this is going to kind of unfold. So Job chapter 1 beginning in verse 1. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He's a good guy. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And this was Job's regular custom. One day, it changes scenes here to, to kind of a scene in heaven. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on the earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. God just exonerated this man. The narrator exonerates this man. He's a good guy. Job is not on trial here. Now, he thinks he's on trial, as we'll see. And it's certainly his friends really think he's on trial. But the book makes it pretty clear that Job is not on trial. And you can think about this kind of as, in like, if you imagine a court situation. Um, his friends essentially think he's a defendant in a criminal case that he's been found guilty by God and is subsequently being judged as as a result. And we can confirm that. So turn with me really quick, a couple pages over, to Job chapter 4. It's one of the first statements from his friends. It's Eliphaz. In Job chapter 4, just uh, uh, 7 and 8, Consider now, he's speaking to Job, who being innocent has ever perished? 
Where, where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have, as I have observed, <laughs> he's kind of arrogant, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble, they, they reap it. So yeah, his friends think that, hey, Job, you've done something. We don't really know what you've done. But you have definitely done something here. The reality, though, is that Job is God's, I, I would call it like an expert witness. So if we go back to the, the idea of a courtroom, jo- Job is not on trial. He's the expert witness. He's God's expert witness in the defense of God's policies. And we'll get into that in just a minute. But for now, Job has trials, but Job isn't on trial. Now, you might, you might say, wait a minute, Chase. Hang on. Job's faith is being tested here. And that's true. I'm not, that is not what I'm talking about. His faith is being tested. But the fact that his faith is being tested is a side effect of Satan's question. And we'll, again, we'll get to that in just a second. So, Key point number two, the book is, it's about God. The book of Job is not about Job. It's about God. We should not, we should try not to pay too much attention to the reasoning of Job's friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, you know, Zophar, and, uh, and Elihu, other than, of course, we can relate to them um, because we, we easily could be th- prone to some of the same thought processes. So the book is about God, not about Job. It can be easy to think that the book is trying to defend um, God's justice, especially since Job, I mean, throughout the whole book, the dialogue sections and stuff like that, Job critiques God's justice, and his friends are defending God's justice. And it's also, of course, an easy thought process for us to fall into. You know, after all, you know, when we suffer, when I suffer, it's pretty easy to, to think, well, maybe God is doing this because, you know, X, Y, Z. But when, when God finally speaks towards the end of the book, he doesn't explain justice at all. He doesn't even talk about justice. Justice, none of that is ever mentioned. Rather, he speaks to his wisdom. He speaks to his wisdom And the whole point that will come out of that is that even when we cannot understand how justice might be working, the idea is to trust in God's wisdom. Or as Isaiah 55 verse 9 puts it, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. It's trust that steps in where knowledge fails. If we had all the answers, we wouldn't need to trust anyone. Number four, it's not how to think about suffering. It, instead, it's how to think about God when we suffer. Nothing in this book is going to tell you why you are suffering or why I'm suffering or why anyone's suffering. It's not going to tell you why suffering exists in the world. It's not going to tell you, you know, why, you know, my... my uh, cousin has, has cancer, you know, why you didn't make good grades, why you're not as popular as you wanted to be, you know, why you didn't get the job you wanted. It's not going to tell you anything about how to understand suffering, but it will tell you how to think about God. And we need that a lot more than we need specific answers to our situations. And probably because if we got specific answers um, to our circumstances, it wouldn't do the next person any good. Um, And so I I would say God's wisdom is on full display in this book. This is a wisdom book. Um, And so we we should keep that always in the back of our minds. So, how to think about God. It's more about trusting than answers. And I've already alluded to this a little bit. Um, but I'm going to kind of stick it up here just to make it official. It's more about trusting than answers. It's more about what constitutes righteousness than about why we suffer. We touched on this a little bit in point number one. You'll remember 
the, that scene in heaven uh, right at the beginning, what was the first thing out of the adversary's mouth um, after being told about Job? Let's go right back. Uh, it's right after, I think it was verse, uh, verse 8. Yeah, so let's read 8 and 9 just for the full, the full idea. Beginning in verse 8 in chapter 1, The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And Satan replies, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You've blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. What is he saying here exactly? What is Satan saying here? He's basically saying, well, God, you do pay the man. You pay him quite well. You, you see, he, Satan doesn't question whether or not Job is actually serving God. He questions his motivations. What motivates Job to be righteous? What is the, I think a good way to think about it is, what is the caliber or the metal of Job's righteousness? Well, the only way we're going to figure that out is, well, you've got to take away his stuff. You've got to take away Job's stuff. I mean, who wouldn't be righteous if God just makes you rich, right? What's there to admire there? If people you know, didn't need a day job serving God, we would, you know, we'd probably have a much more full building. And, you know, <laughs> we laugh at that, but what motivates us? Is it, is it salvation? Is it payment in salvation? Are we Christians solely because of what we stand to gain on this earth or the next? Should we not just serve God because He is God? He is the I Am. Because He is worthy of glory, honor, and there is no greater meaning to be found in this life than to serve the Creator, regardless of salvation. And really, I think we've, we've arrived kind of at this primary question of the book. Does Job serve God for nothing? And do we serve God for nothing? Now, of course, that doesn't mean that, that we don't get anything. After all, God is loving and generous, gracious. We've been promised deliverance and should be eternally grateful uh, for that. And so I'm not, I'm not alluding to that. I, I'm just simply talking about our motivation. So Satan, or the challenger as it's sometimes translated, has posed what is apparently a good question since God allows it to be entertained. His point to God is, and this goes back to, to the key point, the, number one, God, I think you have a flawed policy going on here. You've decided that in general, at least, uh, you're going to bring prosperity to righteous people. Well, when you bring prosperity to righteous people, you're, you're going you're gonna to train them. You know, if, I don't know if y'all have ever heard of Pavlov's uh, dogs, as it were. You're going to train them to have another motive other than righteousness. He's saying, you know, God, you, you don't have followers. You have mercenaries. You have hired help. They don't love you. I don't think that's a good policy. It kind of makes sense. It kind of makes sense, and God entertains it. And so the challenge is, should God have a policy or a rule of, of essentially blessing his followers? And Job is kind of this test case. And there's a, there's a really fun contrast to notice here uh, as a side note. And if anyone has, is kind of rolling the book of Job around, you, you might see it. But when Job starts suffering, do you know what position he takes? He takes the opposite position, <laughs> which is, uh, God, I don't think it's a good idea for righteous people to suffer. <laughs> we're, you know, we're on your side. We're the good guys. Haven't you got worse, you know, other like terrible people to, to pick on? And so that's how the book is set up. 
It's about this idea of righteousness. And so for the sake of this study, uh, I want to focus on two of the primary of, of the questions that we've kind of touched on. I might have messed up here. One second. There we go. So the two things that I want to focus on, do we fear God for nothing? What's the caliber of our righteousness? Why, you know, why, why am I in it? What is my righteousness all about? And then how should I think about God when I'm suffering? So, that was the introduction. Let's step through. Let's step through the book. I'm going to step through portions, and, and again, the, those two points are our focus. And so I'm going to try not to, um, not to get lost in the weeds here. We're going to focus on those two things. There's so many lessons to be learned, I mean, as is the case with any wisdom book. Um, but we're, we're attempting to, to remain focused. So, we begin with the indictment against God's policies, which we've, we've already been through, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Our first stop beyond that is a uh, quick look at Job's wife. This is a major point in the book where Satan's challenge could prove true. And so let's look at chapter 2, verse 9. Chapter 2, verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What, shall we not receive good at the hand of God? Or shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. As I'm sure most of you have noticed, (laughs) the wife is the only family member here that Satan didn't touch. And uh, for good reason, uh, it seems. She's doing a a terrific job at making Satan's case. Here here is a major instance where we see Satan kind of pushing his initial challenge. Because Job's wife is is saying, or basically saying, well, hey, Job, if you're not going to get anything out of this, why bother? You know, Why, why are we doing this? And Job has the correct response. He nails it. And it's essentially... I'm not in this for the money. The caliber of his righteousness is proving to be uh, quite deep already. Next, we come to his three friends. And we mentioned Eliphaz earlier. And their focus is very similar. I know it doesn't seem that way at first, but it's, it, actually, it actually is very similar to Job's wife. It's still on this idea of God blessing the righteous and causing the, uh, the wicked to suffer. And some of you might recognize that. It's, it's actually a very common idea. Um, and in literature, it's commonly referred to as the retribution principle. This is the way Job's friends think uh, the world works. And it sounds great on paper, you know. The problem is, is it just doesn't play out in the real world. When it goes, you know, this way for the what? so like if... Uh, if, it, if, if our life seems to be working this way, so it's like we're being good, you know, and so we are, we are being blessed. And, you know, it goes through, and it, the, this, this whole idea of, of the righteous will prosper and the wicked is going to suffer is fine as long as you're prospering. But then, you know, tragedy happens. And our worldview just, if we, if we think this way, our worldview just falls apart and we're left baffled. Another example of this uh, is in the New Testament, actually. Uh, if you'll turn really quick to John chapter 9. John chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Jesus' disciples here, they, they recognize a perfect opportunity uh, to ask kind of this question that's on the tip of, of a lot of people's tongue. 
and it is a perfect retribution principle uh, question. And so let's read, starting in verse 1. As he went along, he saw a, blind, a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. It's a classic philosophical scenario here. You know, if his parents sinned, well, then why does this guy have to suffer for his whole life being blind? But you can't say that the blind man sinned because he was born this way. So, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Well, wait a minute. You know, I'm just, I'm imagining his apostles. Apostles are thinking, like, wait a minute, we've got, we've got the Son of God right here. Um, this, is, this is the Q&A of all Q&As. Uh, <laughs> I like to picture they're just kind of on the edge of their seat, you know, just waiting it's like, oh man, we're going we're gonna to figure this out. As always, Jesus does not answer that question. He redirects, he poses his own question, and then just tells them what they need to know, which I, I always find uh, just hilarious because he's, he's, he does it over and over throughout Scripture. Um, and I imagine this frustrated the, the, uh, the disciples uh, because he leads it there with, well, neither of them sinned. You know, you can, always, you can already imagine they're just face palming. You know, it's like, hey, we didn't give you a third option. Uh, we, we're pretty sure this is how the world works. But he says that the Son of Man might be glorified. Now, wait a minute. Is, is Jesus saying here that he decided that this guy needed to be born blind before he was born? so that he could make a good impression at this moment in time. Is he giving us here a, a reason as to why he was born blind? I don't, I don't think so. I think he is responding the same way that we see God responding to Job. Instead of a reason or a cause or, or an explanation of the past, instead he's turning the disciples' attention to the present, and, and in this case, the very near future, that the Son of Man to be glorified. That's not, that's not a reason. That's a purpose. And they're two, they're two very different things. It looks to the future instead of the past. And in that, I think we can kind of see a paradigm to ourselves. You know, when things go poorly in life, we want, our knee jerk is to want explanation. We want causes, you know? We want a why. Why is this happening? But here Jesus is saying that hey, those things, they're not, they're not important. Instead, what's the purpose? When life is a train wreck, I don't think we should be wallowing in the why question. We should be asking, how, how can I best serve God? given my current circumstance? Or, what do I do from here? We should seek purposes, not answers. So anyway, going back, hopefully you kept your, uh, your, your fingers marked uh, in Job. Going back to Job's friends, this is where they reside. This idea of the retribution principle that good people prosper, evil people suffer. That's, that's what they think. And I assume they, they also reside in a permanent state of confusion because it just, uh, you just don't see that. It's not always the case. And if, there's so much we could get into here with, with the dialogues, um, but for the sake of our goal, which is primarily uh, its guidance instead of a deep study of the book, We'll jump past specific dialogues uh, between Job and the three friends. Just know that they all take, all three of them, they take various positions around that idea. And their primary concern, essentially, is get your stuff back. That's what they care about. It, it's this typical, it just not focused on what's important. It's, you know, we've got an angry God up there. We don't really know what's going on with that. But... We just got to do, or you, Job, you have to do what you've got to do 
to appease God. That's what you, that's what you should be focused on. And so really they're trying to get Job to recover favor with God, not because favor with God is just a good thing that you want or because God is God, but because, hey, if you do that, then you get blessings. Then you get paid. And again, just like with Job's wife, if Job's listened to them, if he listens to them, What does it show? It shows that Satan was right. It shows that his motive was, in fact, always stuff. Prosperity. That he was in it for the wrong reason. There are some things that Job does get wrong, um, and we'll see God correct him later in the book. You know, he, he thinks wrong and he talks wrong in some instances, Uh, But there are things he gets very right. And um, I'm talking specifically about how he thinks about God and processes his suffering. He gets that wrong. Um, But this answer to all of his friends saying, hey, you need to be focused on getting your stuff back. You know, you need to do what you got to do. Even if you're talking or admitting to things you know you didn't do, just say it, you know. Just say it. If God thinks you did it, well, that's all that matters. Just admit to it and, you know, come clean and get your stuff back. But he handles this very right. So chapter 27, verse 1. 27, verse 1. This is after all those dialogues, all of his friends just hounding on this idea, right? Chapter 27, verse 1. Moreover, Job continued his discourse and said, As God lives, who has taken away my justice. See, even Job, at this point, he still thinks this is about justice. Job doesn't, he's, he's in the retribution principle thought process as well. He thinks that, the, that, that somehow this is still about justice. So, as God lives, who has taken away my justice, and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter, this is kind of him shaking his fist at heaven, made my soul bitter, as long as my breath is in me and the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness. It's like, well, wait a minute, Job, I think you just, I think you just did, so what, what do you mean by that? Nor my tongue utter deceit. Oh, okay, so w- wickedness that is deceit. Okay, what deceit? Far be it from me that I should say that you are right. Ah, there it is. That's the deceit. To admit to what he knows is false. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. My righteousness, my righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. That is the main thing that Job has to get right to combat this challenge from Satan. And he does. And he does. This means that Job did, in fact, have the correct motivation. His motivation was righteousness for the sake of being righteous, not for the sake of stuff. Since Job is seeking righteousness, seeking God because he is God, God was, in fact, right to praise him, to to Satan. And after that, so we hit this this beautiful interlude, uh, the hymn to wisdom in chapter 28. Personally, I don't think this is Job um, because he doesn't doesn't really say anything like what we read here before or after uh, all of this. But regardless, it, it seems like the writer, whoever it is, is saying, okay, listen, we've heard all of these dialogues before this. And these are, you know, these are the wisest people in the world, right? Have they solved it? This is going back to the retribution principle. Have they solved it? No. Are they close? Not, not really. Have we really heard wisdom? Not yet. It's like it's saying we, we've exhausted this human wisdom here. 
and it's got nothing to give us. And so it serves as this, this transition to the second part of the book. So after that interlude, we're, we're introduced to the younger man, Elihu. And there's a lot of good things we could say about Elihu. Uh, as he does say, he says some really good things. It's interesting, I think, to note that he is not commanded to repent like the other three friends that we'll read, uh, we'll go through in just a second. So he definitely gets some things right. But one thing he does get incorrect is that he hold, still holds on to this idea of the retribution principle, that the good prosper, you know, uh, while the wicked suffer. So Job chapter 36. Job chapter 36. Starting in verse 11. We can see, we can see Elihu uh, kind of holding on to this, to this idea. If they obey and serve him, they will spend the rest of their days in prosperity and their years in contentment. There it is. But if they do not listen, they will all perish by the sword and die without knowledge. So we can confront. He's still kind of, he, he can't quite ditch this idea of the retribution principle. On the other hand, something he gets very right is he points out where Job has slipped up. Because at this point in the book, Job is he's starting to get a bit too self-righteous. Uh, if you, if you read the full book, you'll notice that Job's attitude evolves kind of throughout the book. Um, and he, you can tell he gets more and more indignant uh, at his situation, hence why God has him apologize a little later. Uh, in chapter 38, we arrive finally at J God's response to all of this. I know we've alluded to this a little bit, but what, what, does, uh, what does God say? What does he say? Well, if you'll remember our, our key point number three, God doesn't mention justice at all. He doesn't give a why. He doesn't talk anything about, well, since you did this, you are now suffering. None of that. Doesn't touch it. Instead, he speaks to his wisdom. The entire point is that we are to trust. We're to trust in his wisdom. We are not to bother figuring out uh, how justice necessarily is working because it's, above, it's beyond our ability to judge. The why is not important. It's not important. It's the wrong question. It is trust that steps in where knowledge fails. If we had all the answers, we wouldn't have to trust anyone. And finally, the epilogue of the book. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of skim over this just because I'm trying to stay focused on our, uh, on our two primary points. We can just think about the epilogue as confirming God's victory over Satan, uh, over his initial allegations, right? God, is, he essentially says that, well, it looks like I was correct and my policies are doing just fine, and as a result, they will continue, and he, he restores uh, Job's, Job's blessings. And on a very basic level, that is the book of Job. So, that did go a lot quicker than I, than, uh, than I was afraid it might. That is the book of Job. Let's conclude with Romans. I think this, this ties together perfectly. Romans Chapter 11, verse 33. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Bear with me, everyone. want to make sure I hadn't missed something. So, 30, verse 33, and it's almost like Paul in this instance was actually thinking about Job because it just fits so well. The depth and the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments. His paths can't be traced. And he's basically saying you can't deduce how God 
thinks via how your life is going. You can't, you can't do that. Who has known the mind of the Lord? That isn't a place that we can go. The mind of God, we can't think that we can relate to that. Or who has been his counselor? We can't out God, God. We can never think that we would do it better. Who has ever given to God that he should repay them? This is the retribution principle again. What does God owe us? He has nothing to repay. I, I would even go so far as to say that's just that's a silly idea if you think about it. God owes us nothing. For from Him and through Him and for Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. It's all about God. It's all about God. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And, what, and that's, that's what's said at the beginning of Job, that he feared God and shunned evil. Trust that God is God. I hope that this has been beneficial for all of you tonight. There has not been much in here uh, telling you how you might go about seeking righteousness. Under Christ's new law, step one would be how to become a Christian. And if you are willing, we would love to help you with that. Uh, we would love to help you begin that walk tonight. So if that applies, please feel free to come front, come up front and stand as we stand to sing.